gears off the message I was going to do as of yesterday about this time, the different one last night, so here we are. Um, we'll see how this one lands. Um, uh, Nathan and his family, uh, family uh, have got quite a bit of sickness going on with them, and, and he was he didn't ask this for you guys, he was asking for me to be praying for them, but if you would be praying for them as well, so uh, uh, not uh, not so much metal this morning, but uh, that's okay, and uh, we appreciate uh, Jen and Matt and Fudge and him stepping up. Uh, Chad's and like Disney World or something, so you know, don't feel sorry for him at all because it's warm there and it's not that here. Uh, so I'm uh, supposed to get pretty pretty cold. So uh, anyway, but uh, yeah, so glad you guys could make it out and uh, glad you're not sick. So uh, if uh, if you got a Bible, go ahead and get it out. We're gonna we're gonna bounce through a few passages this morning. If you don't have a Bible, our ushers can bring you one. Feel free to. 
to borrow one or if you don't own one, we'd love for you to take that one. You can keep it. We'd love for you to have one uh, and be able to uh, have it for yourself and study it. It's, it's God's Word, and we'd love, love for you to have a copy of it. But uh, <coughs> this morning, um, we, uh, we're going to look through uh, three passages, um, and really they're very similar. And uh, uh, this kind of happened haphazardly as I was studying Scripture, and I've kept coming back to one of these passages uh, because of, uh, I, I meet with uh, three guys once a week, uh, what we call micro group, okay? So not to get confusing here, but I'll explain a little bit of it. Uh, we have what's called micro churches. That's our small group uh, ministry here. Um, uh, micro churches meet in people's homes and uh, you know are you know fellowshipping together in community together, uh, pushing each other toward Jesus. Usually eating together, praying together, sometimes uh, getting in the Word together and that kind of thing. Uh, but then in the micro groups. Uh, these are groups of folks that uh, kind of uh, can come straight from that micro church, smaller groups of people that gather together, and the, and the point of those is discipleship. It is like, hey, we're going to just study scripture together, and, and it's very, you know, very, very, you know, whatever, I hate to use the word organic because it feels overused all the time these days, but whatever, it is what it is. Uh, just, you know, not so planned out except for, you know, hey, we're going to study uh, like for my guys and I, we study like one chapter of scripture every week, uh, and then we get together once a week, and we just, we talk about that passage, and then we, we check on each other and pray for each other. It takes about an hour. Uh, uh, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do it. Uh, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to do it. You just have to be willing to make time to do it. Uh, and so I, I, we'll, we'll be talking about more, more of that this year, the micro groups. You hear a lot about micro churches, but uh, we want to encourage people uh, to be making disciples. You know, all through Scripture, over and over and over, we see Jesus talk about making disciples. Make disciples, make disciples, make disciples. And, and the truth is, is we're guilty of making all kinds of stuff and very rarely disciples. And, 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 and that's, it's heavy on, it's heavy on my heart and it's heavy on the heart of, of the rest of our staff and, and even many of our deacons I've talked with and, and other folks that I've talked to, some of you. Uh, about some of this, and, and, and we talk about specifically making disciples sometimes without actually talking about making disciples, uh, but that's, that's, that's something we're called to. That's something that we're supposed to be about. We don't, we, don't see, we don't see Jesus instructing us to make really much of anything else, uh, but disciples is the thing he keeps coming back to, uh, we keep seeing in Scripture, and so we'll be talking about that more this year. It's important. I mean, it's huge, huge to our faith. If we're not in the process of that, generally speaking, we're not growing in our faith. And, and so, we're, you know, heavy on my heart is kind of the lackadaisical approach to our walk with Christ that so many of us are guilty of taking a lot of days. Um, and and, and that, that just permeates <laughs> through different ways and because of how busy we are and uh, the way culture is and all kinds of things. But... Um, neither here nor there, in an encouraging way, I'm praying that this year could be a year for, for all of us, especially as a church, uh, to latch on to what it looks like for us to uh, make disciples and, and to love on one another, care for one another well, because uh, uh, even in micro groups, even, or even in micro churches, it's still easy to, you can, you can show up and, you know, you can fly on the radar if you, if you want to. You can lie to everybody and tell everybody everything's okay and you know, and eat a brownie and sit, you know, uh, sit in the corner or whatever. No, I'm good. I don't got anything, you know, whatever. Uh, the micro group stuff makes it a little tougher to do that. And uh, you know, the, the point the point is the point is not just like, are we okay? The point is, are we pursuing Jesus? Are we pursuing Jesus? And I want I want that to kind of like fall on us for a minute because I think that that's huge for us this morning. And so, um, in my micro group, in our micro group, I should say, um, one of the things that we've done is we've studied through the book of Colossians here in the last few months. Uh, a couple of months ago, we went through it, it took about a month because it's four chapters or whatever, and four weeks. Um, and um, the first chapter of Colossians, there was a part of the passage that, as we were studying it, that just kind of grabbed on to me about something that Paul was talking about that he was doing. If you notice, 
Um, so if you're not super familiar with scripture, uh, in the New Testament, we have all these books that, were, that God used a guy named Paul to write. And many of them were letters to churches, like specifically to churches of different towns. And, and so you've got like the book of Ephesians, which was to uh, the church uh, at Ephesus. You know, you've got uh, the book of Colossians, which was a letter to the church at Colossae, you know, and so on and so forth. Philip, Philip, uh, Philippians, church at Philippi, so on and so forth. And so, uh, you know, but in a lot of these letters, you have this greeting at the beginning uh, that Paul makes, and, and there's some similarities in them, and 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 I, I didn't know that I was going to go here today, but that, that's kind of where God's led me to, and we'll just kind of see how it goes, uh, but this, in the letter to uh, Colossae, the church of Colossae, the book of Colossians, in fact, if you want to turn to the book of Colossians, that's where we're going to be going here in just a minute, but in the beginning of the book of Colossians, we see one of these greetings. Well, we also see a very similar greeting in the book of Ephesians, we also see a very similar reading in the book of Philippians. And as I was just, I kind of kept coming back to the possibility of me uh, teaching about this part of this in Colossians, and then kind of haphazardly started reading uh, the same similar, we'll say same, but very similar greeting in the book of Ephesians. And then I started thinking, you know, he does this a lot in a lot of these, and I thought, especially with what we know as the epistles, those four books uh, you know, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, uh, you know, I, I just got thinking, you know, what, what, how similar are all those greetings and are there commonalities among them that we should be paying more attention to? Because this is one of those passages of scripture that generally speaking, when we, when we like set out on our, you know, I'm going to study through Philippians for the next couple of weeks kind of, you know, mentality, this is one of those passages that like we kind of rush through. Because we're like, well, I want to get to the meat. But that, and that's what caught me off guard about, you know, when we were looking at Colossians several weeks ago. And I saw this that just kind of stood out to me. And it challenged me specifically in something that I think that we could all, you know, stand to do a little more of. Which is in how he was praying for those people. And so this morning, really a lot of what we're talking about this morning is prayer. Uh, but as a whole, we're going to look at these little greetings, uh, and we'll read through them, and then we're going to talk about some commonalities, and we'll just see where it goes, okay? Everybody good with that? Good. I'm leading the ship, so you don't have a choice, right? <laughs> Colossians chapter 1, verse 3. This is, this is where we're headed this morning, and uh, this is the first of those. We'll read this, and then we'll, we'll read it in Ephesians. We'll read it in, the, in Philippians 2. Um, it says this in uh, Colossians 1, verse 3. It says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we pray for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. So he's, he's letting them know, been praying for you, but not only have we been praying for you, but we've been thanking God for you. So there's, there's some encouragement going on. And in verse 4 it says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints... Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you. Since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Now, there's quite a bit going on here, and it's, it's going to be challenging to, to hit each of these and not me want to talk about every little aspect here. But there's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot of things going on, and I, I want to encourage you to kind of like really see the things that he's saying and how he's talking to them, and specifically the things that uh, he's been praying for them about, and he is recognizing some things in them in each of these that I think is very similar, uh, and we'll, 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 we'll bust those things out here in just a few minutes. Um, he talks about, uh, you know, the love that they have for each other, the love that they have for Jesus, the hope that they have in heaven, that the gospel in of itself is bearing fruit in the world. I think we forget that. I think that we forget that. In fact, I, I think that we give Satan way too much credit and we're just like, you know, he's just he's got full around the place and all this kind of stuff. And we just completely forget uh, that he's not God. 
We, 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 in fact, we blame things on Satan sometimes. That we're just like, you know, again, I think we just we give him too much power sometimes. At the same time, there's plenty of people that don't think anything about spiritual warfare. And they're not thinking anything about any of that. And the truth is, is that he does exist. Uh, he does prey on us at times and things like that. Um, but, but the gospel is bearing fruit in the world. And it's bearing fruit right now as we talk about Jesus. Like right now in this room, in this place, and to anybody that's listening to this, it is bearing fruit. The truth of Jesus, the grace of God, it is bearing fruit in our lives. And it says, and increasing, right there it says that in verse 6, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. So, you know, awesome peace, awesome peace. He's recognizing that he's writing to a group of people who have believed in Jesus. Now, you may be sitting here today, and maybe you haven't believed in Jesus. Maybe you're maybe you're dating the idea of being a part of a church or seeing what church is about, or you heard about the Jesus thing and trying to figure out where that goes uh, and if it does fit into your life or whatever. And, and and let me just say this: that that is that is the biggest piece of your life that you will ever try to figure out. It is the numero uno biggest thing that you could ever ever begin to figure out and spend the rest of your life pursuing and figuring out what is that what is the grace of God in truth I mean what a, what a great statement it's making there and we'll talk some more about that verse 7 it goes on it says it says just as you learned uh, from Epaphras or whatever you want to call him uh, our beloved fellow servant he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so really, Paul is just, Paul is kind of acknowledging this guy who is probably, if we had to guess, we don't know this for sure, but probably if we had to guess, probably the guy that planted the church uh, at Colossae. And so a lot of people think that all of these uh, places where Paul wrote uh, letters to all these churches that he planted all these churches that he started all these churches uh, but the truth is, is that he didn't start all of them uh, and more than likely this God did start this church and he's acknowledging hey this guy's already been telling you about Jesus he's been faithful to the Lord uh, uh, you know and on your behalf and all this kind of stuff and he's made it says verse 8 and he has made known to us your love in the spirit so he's been communicating back to Paul he's been saying hey these people here have been following Jesus it's been incredible we've got a good ride going on Paul's in the meantime been praying for them and all that verse 9 it goes on and says and so from this from the day we heard we have not ceased to pray for you from the day we heard we have not ceased to pray for you now this is where it gets into what i was talking about about me personally like with me and my guys when we were studying uh colossians not all that long ago uh when god just really started convicting my heart about where i wasn't praying <laughs> okay and, and, and just reading what Paul is saying here, and he says, from the day we heard, in other words, from the day we heard about when you guys started to follow the Lord, started to follow Jesus, trusted in Jesus, believed in him, from that day forward, we have not ceased to pray for you. And he goes on and says, and, and, and it, so he, first of all, he has, they haven't stopped praying for them, but then he talks about what and how they've been praying for them. He says, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. <clears throat> so when we got to this with me and my guys, um, and I, I don't think these guys remind me talking about them, it's uh, uh, Troy Lincoln, you know, the woo guy, you know. Uh, he's, he's with the students. In fact, our students are gone. If you didn't know our whole student ministry, and I don't know how many kids did it take. Do we have any idea? Say what? 40 or, 40 or 50, 40, 50 teenagers, and then, you know, a bunch of adults that have lost their minds have gone to Gatlinburg, and they left early this morning, and Lee and Carol have stayed behind because Jack traded in his sister for a new girl and all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't, I'm sorry, I can't help. Four, 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 four. I'm so sorry, Katie, I'm so sorry. Chris, they're watching this. So, all I'm trying to do is tell you who's in my micro group. <laughs> So Troy and Chris Miller uh, and Zach Aaron uh, are the guys that I meet with. We meet on Tuesday nights at like 9 o'clock in my basement. And that's just what works with people's work schedules. So that's when we do it. 
Um, and when we got to this point in the passage, <laughs> when we got to this point in the passage, you know, I, I was sitting there thinking about like, you know, what would it look like? Like how, how would, how could life possibly be different for myself and for people that I might pray for if I were to be praying for them without ceasing, first of all, and then, and then we read the next line asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And I was like, man, I need people praying for me about that. And, and, you know, and, and, and so then one, and then one of the guys, I think one of the other guys is the one that says, like, what if we committed to pray for each other like that? And I was like, you know, like how, how stupid do we have to be that we miss this kind of stuff? And again, this is, again, one of those passages where we're like, hey, let's rush through the green thing so we can get to the meat. And I'm just like, wait a second. Like this is this is a challenge. Like Paul is putting on display what it looks like for us to pray for one another. And it goes on, it doesn't stop there. Verse 10, it says, so as to walk, again, he's still talking about how he's praying for them. But we'll, let's, in fact, let's we'll continue reading uh, from what we just read a second ago. Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Verse 9, verse 10. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened, it hasn't stopped, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from, and then, so then he's like throwing in reminders. He's like, so, you know, as we're praying this, let's don't forget. He's like, verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of our beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Wow. And so for weeks after reading that, for weeks, I've, I've kept going back to that. And, 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 and us four guys, we, you know, we said, hey, we're going to try to start praying for each other every day. And we're going to try to pray something like that. <laughs> we're, going to try, we're going to try to pursue Jesus for one another, for one another's sakes, that we would understand God's will more that we would pursue him more, that we would gain knowledge of who he is, that God would lead us and show us who he is leading us to be. And the outcome of that could be that we bear fruit for the kingdom of God, if you just want to sum up a little bit of that. Here. I mean, so simple. It's so simple, we're not doing it most of the time. I mean, just to be honest, you know, and, 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 and I, I'll, shout, I'll challenge you. I'll challenge you. You think you pray about God leading you to do that with other people in 2018. Don't do 2018 like you did 2017. Make some changes that lead to you pursuing Jesus. Make changes that lead to you pursuing Jesus. Now, here, here's, here's where I, I have no idea how I'm going to, like, make all this function as a message. We're just going to read a couple more passages and just kind of see where it lands. Ephesians chapter 1. I want to read this next reading. And I want to show you kind of some of the similarities that we're seeing here. Ephesians 1. And somebody, may, somebody else might have done this in a different order, but it's what I got Ephesians 1, verse 15. And it says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. And this, again, the whole, this is a whole other letter. It's a whole other church getting this letter here. Okay, so different, different group of people. It says this, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus 
and your love toward all the saints. So already there's a commonality. Um, you know, well, two, two commonalities. He's heard about their faith. And secondly, he's heard about their love toward others. Okay? And then it goes on and says, I do not cease to give thanks for you. So, next commonality, he's not stopping praying. He is praying, 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 praying every day. He is not stopping seeking the Lord for these people. And the truth is, he probably has never met most all of these people. Maybe he's met some of them we don't really know. And it goes on, it says, I do not cease to give thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers, that God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. So again, he's, he's, he's telling them, uh, I'm, I'm praying, I'm thanking God for you. Okay, number one, I'm thanking God for you. I'm giving thanks for you. And then he goes on, he says, and I'm praying that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. So he's asking God, he's like, God, please help them to know you. You, you, you know, the funny, here's the funny thing. This is kind of coming to me right now. Funny thing about these, these passages, we don't see Paul spending a whole lot of time, like, you know, praying for, you know, their sicknesses and all this kind of stuff. And we, we do see that in other passages. But this whole, like, not ceasing praying thing, he's praying for the same stuff for, the, for different groups of people. And he's praying that God would reveal himself to them, that they would know him more, that they would know about him more. It says that the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And in verse 18, it goes on saying, it says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Having your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. My gosh, what a statement. What a statement. I mean, that's so good. That's so good. We could only, we could only dream that somebody might pray that for us every day of our life. Having our hearts in light, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. And then it goes on. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? This is talking about being a part of the family of God. This is talking about being a part of the body. He's writing to the church, the bride of Jesus. He's writing to her, which is us. And he's saying to her, I am praying that you would know the Lord in ways that will blow your mind. Having your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? You don't get an inheritance, usually speaking, unless you are part of the family. <clears throat> One of the beautiful things that happens when we believe upon Jesus to be our Savior, when we trust in Him, when we're saved by God uh, for what He's done for us, not because of what we can earn or how good we can be or any of that stuff, it is, it is complete grace. It is something we don't deserve, uh, first of all. Uh, and secondly, it is something that only comes through Jesus and the blood that was shed on the cross uh, that made Him the sacrifice for our sins. You know, sin, sin has a punishment. If you didn't know, the punishment's death. We see that all through Scripture. God stepped in to make a way that we didn't have to take death, that we could receive forgiveness, that we could receive forgiveness. God made a way that He would take that death from us by us putting Jesus on the cross. This is how we enter the family of God. We can't be good enough for it. 
It's not about what we can do. It's not about how much church we can go to, how many things we can we can serve in and minister in and do all these things and be good to neighbors and all those things that we're called to do. But the truth is, is that those things should flow out of our affection because of who God is in our lives. One of the things that I'm encouraged about as I read through these things that Paul is talking about, praying and giving thanks for these people, is I'm just constantly reminded, uh, reminded, <laughs> reminded, uh, I was, I'm trying to like put two words together and I wasn't ready. Uh, constantly reminded of the grace, that was the other word, uh, reminded, I don't know how that worked, but whatever. Uh, I'm constantly reminded, reminded again. Wow. It's a new, it's a new word. Can we get that on Wikipedia from Cheatham County? We just reminded down here. Oh my God. Um, so fast, so fast, it sinks so fast. The ship. Um, <laughs> reminded of the grace in which we have received that we don't deserve. We don't deserve. And yet God gives it and gives it freely to anybody that believes no matter all the stuff that we've done in our lives. No matter how bad we've been in our lives, God can bring us from the depths and give us new life and give us a calling. A calling, it says. It, what's it say in verse 18? It says that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Kaboom! You have a calling. You thought only preachers got callings, did you? <laughs> You're thinking, I got a calling, all right. I have my family sick, and they've been calling me, wanting to come over to my house. No, no, this is this is something special, and it's because we are a part of the family of God. It's because we receive an inheritance that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you. What are the riches of His glorious inheritance? in the saints because let me help you understand something the inheritance doesn't start when we die the inheritance doesn't start with a heaven or a life thereafter the inheritance started the moment that you trusted the blood of Jesus to be enough to save you from your sin Amen. that's amazing that's amazing and it is life changing and it will alter the rest of your life if you'll let it and it says, so what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? In verse 19, and what, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the great, to the working of his great might? Remember, this is one of those passages that we're kind of like, let's rush through that so we can get to the meat. <laughs> I don't know what we're looking for, but this might be some of the best stuff we're ever going to get. According to the working of his great might. Let's just start verse 19 over. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? So even, even our belief, even our belief, he's laying claim to it. He's laying claim that it is having to do with his great work. The work of his great mother. Verse 20. That he worked in Christ. When he raised him from the dead. And seated him at the right hand. In the heavenly places. Far above all rule. And authority and power and dominion. And above every name. That is named. Not only in this age. But also in the one to come. And he put all things together. Under his feet. And gave him as head over all things. To the church, which is his body and fullness of him who fills all in all. Amazing. Amazing, and I'm speechless. Let's go to Philippians 1. Philippians 1. Do we still got another greeting? That's just fluff so that we can read it to get to the good stuff, right? Okay, here we go. Philippians 1, verse 3. <coughs> 
Philippians 1 verse 3 says this, says, I thank God in my remembrance of you. So again, we see him thanking God for the church at Philippi now. Different church, different group of people, different letter. He's still thanking God for them. And in verse 4 it says, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, reel back just for a second here. This is while Paul's in prison, okay? So Paul's writing this from prison, okay? And, uh, and he's talking about the joy that he is receiving for being reminded of what God is doing in and through them. In verse 5, it goes on and says, Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And he considers them partners. And uh, actually in studying on this a little bit, I've read where it would have commonly been believed and thought of that like if you were in prison and let's just say, let's just say you got a letter from, you know, somebody in prison or in jail or whatever, um, you know, that they, that would have been very frowned upon. I mean, you know, we don't like to think about, you know, our people that we love going to jail or going to prison or whatever. Uh, but I would say that there's a little less shame about it than what there would have been in this culture. And the fact that this would have been a letter that they were willing to share with one another and probably share publicly within uh, their church gatherings, uh, I think is a huge deal because what it, what it was saying was it, it is very much, he recognizes that they have a partnership, verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel, he recognized that they are partners together. And, and I'm sure that part of this and why he can find joy in the partnership that they have specifically is probably an encouragement to him to know there are people out there who care, not only care about me, but they're not ashamed of me. Kind of a, kind of a cool little nuance there. And verse 6 says, And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Folks, that, that verse right there alone, we, that's one of those verses like we need to be reminded of that. Paul is sure of something here in this verse. And what it is that he is sure of is that God has began a work, begun a work in them, and he is going to complete it. That should be, that should be great news for us today. That should be fantastic news for us today. That we could understand that God has started a work in us and he is going to complete it is, is bigger than we may imagine. I'll read it again. He says, and I'm sure of this. <laughs> I love that. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way about you all. See, even them, they said you all, right? Because, let's stop. Because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. And again, he's talking about that imprisonment thing, like he recognizes that they have not left him behind or forgotten about him, but they stand in solidarity with him, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. So this is pretty amazing on the sense of the whole, like we've already talked about the imprisonment part, but again, he recognizes that they also are standing for the gospel where they are. And he, he is encouraging them in that, recognizing that in them. Verse 8, it goes on, it says, For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer, and here we go, we're back to, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent, so you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I can't believe I actually read through all those 
in that amount of time. Because there's so much stuff that I'm jumping over. I'm like, man, I don't want to talk about it. Um, there's a purpose in us doing this. It isn't so that we dissect every single piece of this. It's so that we recognize, I think, some just very basic things. Some very basic things that we could adopt. We could adopt to pray for one another about. And how might God use that, not only in the lives of those people, but might how he used that in our lives. What if we pray those things every day? You, you realize that when we pray those types of things, we're talking about like being reminded that God has started a work in us, that he is going to finish. Things like that are reminders that change the trajectory of our day and our weeks and our months, and that turns into years. Especially if we do it without ceasing. Especially if we do it every single day. Here are things, here's just a, and I'm probably missing something, but here's just a few. Here is a handful of things that I see common between these three introductions that we see Paul write. <coughs> Some of it, most of it, in how he's praying for them. Number one, gratitude. He's thankful for them. He's thankful for them. How many people in your life need to know that you are thankful for them. Your bad days, all right? Your bad days are usually spent, if we're honest with each other, okay? If we're honest with each other, your bad days and my bad days are spent thinking that nobody cares. That's a lie. And we know it's a lie. We can sit here right now, we can talk about it, we, we can identify and go, well, yeah, it's a lie. But the truth is, is that we buy it some days of our life and Satan loves it. Gratitude. How would it change the lives of those people that we are praying for, or maybe that we're going to be praying for, if we let them know how much we care for them, how much we love them, the things that we're praying for them about? What if, what if we begin praying for those people that God lays on our heart to pray for? You know, I think, I think it's an easy, like, hey, we, can, we should be praying for one another as the body of believers, as the local church and all that. Uh, but let's say specifically, like, people that God may be laying on our hearts. And God is laying, I trust that if you are a believer right now, that God is laying some people on your hearts. Although I'm sure for many of us, we're probably sitting here going, man, I just hope somebody will pray for me like that. Well, how about it start with you? Okay. How about it starts with you, and then it goes out, and you begin to pray for how thankful you are for those people when you love them. Secondly, the affection. The affection piece. He lets them know how much he cares for them. He lets them know how much he loves them. Furthermore, he prays for their affection for others. That it may go out and abound more. That it may bear fruit. Okay? You see those similarities to those? Okay? He prays for them that their holiness would increase. He prays for them that, that their godliness would increase. That they would be more like Christ. Man, what a, what a simple prayer, but so good for us today. And so good for those people that we care about who are Christians, who are believers, who we're, we want to encourage them to pursue Jesus. We we want to help them be disciples. And, and, see, and, and there's the problem. I think so many people, when they hear the terminology, make disciples, we've, got, we've, we've, we've gotten so studied up in, in our church past or something that we've begun to believe that if you're going to make disciples, that must mean that you, you must have like some curriculum memorized. Making disciples is just pursuing Jesus together. Doing life together. What it's not is doing it apart. Can't do it apart. We are sinking ships apart. We need one another. He prays for their wisdom and knowledge of God and their discernment. <clears throat> that, they would, that they would be given revelation as they follow and pursue Jesus as to who he is and what he is calling them to do. <laughs> I'm just going to warn you, okay? I'm, here's the warning. 
and you can take it for what it's worth and you may laugh it off and think, I'm no big deal, whatever. I'm going to warn you. And maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should just let you fall into it. But I'm going to warn you. I'm going to warn you this way. If you pursue Jesus and you pursue the calling that he has for you, I am almost going to guarantee it doesn't look like yours. You know, what do you mean, Chris? You just said my calling. Yes, no. I mean the one that you're picking out for your life right now. I, I'm, I'm just going to warn you. God is probably going to change the trajectory of things, major things in your life if you pursue him. But, you know, you can just keep it in cruise control and just go to church and just be a good Christian and, you know, wave at your neighbor. What's up, neighbor? Good looking car. That's not a good looking car. I don't like that. <laughs> because cruise control, let's just face it, cruise control is where it's easy to live. But it is not where we are called to be. I, 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 and and I'm, not, I'm not putting something on the table for you that you should take up a mantle and go do this or do that. I'm saying to you, you pursue Jesus and you see what he leads you to do. And when you get there, don't be surprised when it doesn't look like what you thought. I had no intention of ever being a pastor of a church. I ran from it pretty well. God's, what's that? Give it to me, what'd you say? Not well enough. Not well enough, that's right. That's right. Oh, we don't run for long. The miserableness sets in. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's truly an amazing thing when we do find that calling and we follow what it is. I'm not saying God's calling everybody to be pastors. I'm not that dumb. God doesn't want everybody to be pastors. Some of you would make terrible pastors. Let's face it. I make a terrible pastor most days. Of the week. <laughs> but what does it look like for us to pursue Jesus? To pursue Jesus for one another. And what does that do for us in our pursuit of Jesus? I'm not saying that's why we should do it. But I'm just throwing it out there. I'm going to bet it is going to change your life as you pursue Jesus for one another. In essence, you're pursuing Jesus for you. And you too will gain wisdom of knowledge of God and discernment that you never had before. He prays. He prays for them that they would bear fruit. Well, you don't bear fruit without watering the, the deal. Maybe even a little fertilizer. He prays that their love would abound more. You know, here, here's the truth about people. And we know this. You know people right now in your life, maybe God's laying on your heart right this minute, that you see in them great things that God would probably want to use them for. In fact, not probably, he probably created them for that they don't see in themselves. They don't believe in themselves because they're down on themselves. All right. But the second that we begin to encourage them in those things, that their love would abound more, that they would have influence in the lives of other people, that other people's lives would be changed because of their willingness to, to love and share and care for others. And sometimes that needs a push in our lives. We know that we need that sometimes. We need that push sometimes in our lives. He prays about, in every one of these, he prays, he prays for them that they would look for their hope to be eternal. He talks about the inheritance. He talks about uh, the eternal element of this. Uh, and, and folks, let's just face it, we, we need help with that because we're here. We're here and most of the time that's all we see is here. We, we can't see past here because we're like, well, I got all this going on right now, Chris. We, you know, we're, we got all these plates spinning and they're really important to here, you know. And we miss that our hope can't be here. And it's why sometimes we have such a hard time understanding things about this crazy world we live in. 
put. Oh, I can't believe this crazy world. What's, what in the world? He's praying that we would look to a future, that we would be reminded of the eternal, and that our hope would be in Christ and not here, and in a life thereafter. But we're being reminded that the inheritance came as soon as we believed in Christ, which he orchestrated according to him, which is amazing. The saints, he prays that we would encourage the saints. He prays that they would encourage the saints. Who's the saints? <coughs> the saints go marching. The saints are the body. The saints are the church. We are the saints. Some of you never thought you'd get called that, did you? <laughs> People are like, you don't know me very well. We are called to this for one another, for the sake of the gospel, for lives changed. Lastly, the thing that I see him constantly go over and over in each of these is he recognizes, he recognizes in each of them that he celebrated from the day in which they believed in Jesus. He talks about their commonality, and he says it differently than we do. And I made note of this because I think it's interesting. Because when we, when we're out in public and we see one another, we're like, "Hey, what's going on?" And then we got somebody else that we meet, and it's like, "Oh, hey, this is my friend, you know, Buddy, and Buddy, I know Jimmy from church, you know." And we're like, "Oh, okay, cool," you know. Paul says it differently. Paul doesn't say our commonality is church. Paul says our commonality is the gospel. It's Jesus. How would that change our language? I mean, we love, we love our church. I mean, it's, it's fine to love your church. But instead of it being about our church, what if it's just about Jesus? What's that look like? How's that change those conversations and those moments? And what, <coughs> what does that say? To those people about what's important to us. Uh, I'll tell you what it does say. It doesn't, it doesn't try to like, I'm trying to influence you right now that you should come to my church kind of conversation. It's a I want you to know that Jesus is important to me and this guy, buddy. And I think we need more of that. He recognizes that God has done something through his son. He talks about, in the, in the first passage we read, he talks about, in fact, I'll go first uh, Corinthians 1, verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of that and of the love that you have for all the saints. I mean, that one verse right there just sums up a whole bunch of what we just talked about. But I think for us today to be reminded of the gospel and who God is and what he's done for us and that we get grace is amazing. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to partake in communion, the Lord's Supper, in a few minutes, in just a minute. Uh, and then out of that time of being reminded of what Christ has done for us and celebrating and remembering who he is and what he's done, I, I want to challenge you to do something. I want to challenge you to do something. You ready? Because it takes action. I know, how, I know how church people are with this sometimes. Okay? I want to challenge you to pray. I want you to think right now. In fact, I want you to bow your head with me right now. I just want to, so you just kind of focus for a second. I want you to think about the people that God is laying on your heart. The people that you know that you need to pray for. Some of these may be people that are believers. Some of these may be people who don't know the Lord. And you may want to pray that God will intercede in their life and do a work and save them. You might need to pray for some family members right now. But, but, but here's what we're going to do. 
I'm going to pray for us. We're going to take the Lord's Supper. And then I want you to pray for those people. And you can pray these things that we've just talked about. And you can open the passages back up if you need to. And we're going to give you several minutes to spend some time praying for others. And you can do that at your seat or you can do it down front. I don't really care. If you need somebody to pray for you, we will be down here. We'll be glad to do that. We're going to switch it up, kind of change it a little bit. The band will come and they'll be playing. Um, but I, I want us to kind of get in the mode of thinking about what's it look like for us to love others well by lifting them up to our Lord and Savior. Let's pray together. God, we, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for using Paul in the lives of the people that were the people that made up these churches. And that we have these letters, that we have your word to go by to see, Lord, what you have done in the lives of others. And God, I pray that you would challenge us this morning. God, that we would lift up others to you, that you would do a great work in their heart and in their lives. God, people that we are thankful for, people, uh, Lord, that we love and care for, God, that we want to see them pursue you, to know you, to know more about you. God, do those works in their lives. God, as we lift those people up to you today, God, I pray, Lord, that you would hear our prayers. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. Through your son, Jesus, and in his name we pray. Amen.